All right, how are you there, folks? I'm back. I've been reading this uh, weekend, and I talked about this book, I Am That, a few episodes ago, and I didn't go re-watch it. But I remember saying that in a lot of ways I felt that what Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj says in this book uh, seems very similar to what Dogen talks about in Shobo Genzo. Although the terminology is different and there's a, there's a different sort of approach. I think that the Advaita Vedanta approach and the Zen approach to the nature of reality and what it is and, and kind of expressing what it is are real similar. But over the weekend I came across a passage which I thought at first pointed out an essential difference in their conception of reality. And it comes from this book, Pointers from Nisargadatta Maharaj by Ramesh Balsakar. This is uh, Ramesh Balsakar's reminiscences, or whatever, remembrances, of things he heard Nisargadatta Maharaj say when he served as Nisargadatta Maharaj's translator. But here's the passage. I copied it down into my iPhone for easier looking upableness. Balsakar reports that. Once, during the course of a session, Maharaj was explaining why death has such a traumatic terror for the average person, whereas to him, it would be an experience to look forward to, as it would mean release from the limitation which the phenomenon of the body naturally imposes on consciousness. Once the body dies, manifested consciousness is released and merges with the impersonal consciousness like a drop of water merges with the ocean. Now, having read that, I remembered a passage from Dogen's Bendoa, which I'll read to you from the Nishijima Cross translation. Bendoa means something like a talk on practicing the way, the Buddhist way. And it's one of Dogen's most famous pieces of writing. Someone asks, it has been said that there is a very quick way to get free of life and death, that is, to know the truth that the mental essence is eternal. In other words, this physical body, having been born, necessarily moves toward death, but this mental essence never dies at all. Once we have been able to recognize that the mental essence, which is unmoved by birth and decay, exists in our own body, we see this as the original essence. Therefore, the body is just a temporary form. It dies here and is born there, never remaining constant, but the mind is eternal. It is unchangeable in the past, present, and future. Those who know this principle stop the past cycle of life and death forever, and when this body passes, they enter the essence ocean. When they present themselves in the essence ocean, they gain wondrous virtues like those of the Buddha Tathagatas. Even if we passed our whole life in idle sitting, Zazen, uh, what could we expect to gain? The doctrine I have expressed like this is truly in accord with the truth of the Buddhas and ancestors, is it not? That's the question that Dogen is, uh, is giving. Dogen's answer is as follows. I say the view expressed now is absolutely not the Buddha Dharma. According to that non-Buddhist view, there is one spiritual intelligence existing within our body. When this intelligence meets conditions, it can discriminate between pleasant and unpleasant and discriminate between right and wrong, and it can know pain and irritation and know suffering and pleasure. All these are abilities of the spiritual intelligence. When the body dies, however, the spirit casts off the skin and is reborn on the other side. So even though it seems to die here, it lives on there. Therefore, we call it immortal and eternal. The view of the non-Buddhist is like that, but if we learn this view as the Buddha's dharma, the delusion would be too shameful for comparison. So that is his absolute denial that this is the way things are. So, if you take that and you, and you just stop right there, you can say, okay, Nisargadatta Maharaj says one thing, Dogen says another, there's no compatibility between them. You can take Dogen's word for it, you can take Nisargadatta Maharaja's word for it, you can take neither of them's word for it, it doesn't matter, but you can't claim that they're the same, so therefore Brad must have been wrong when he was saying that he found a lot of congruence between uh, Nisargadatta Maharaj and Dogen. But, let's continue. Here's what Ramesh Balsakar says after he reports that little bit of the conversation that I just read. Maharaj sensed that a visitor had some questions on this point, that's the, the point that he just talked about. The visitor said, Maharaj has said that what actually happens in death is that the breath, the life force, leaves the body and mingles with the air outside. Consciousness also leaves the body and merges with the impersonal consciousness, and the dead body is destroyed one way or another. Nothing remains of that particular physical form which was created and in due course destroyed. 
If this process applies to both the ignorant and to the jnani, jnani is their word for somebody who has uh, gained knowledge and, and done practice, uh, then what need is there to become a jnani? And here is Maharaja's response. When you talk about an ignorant person and a jnani, and the need for an ignorant person to become a jnani, do you not assume that there is an independent and autonomous individual capable of exercising personal volition according to his choice and decision, in the process whereby the phenomenal universe comes into manifestation, is there a provision for such independent entities? So do they even really exist? And he goes on. What is the basic conceptual framework without which manifestation of the phenomenon would not be possible? I hate double negatives, but we'll just keep going on. We'll press on, because I think it becomes clearer. If there were not a concept of space constituting volume, could an object have been apparent with three dimensions? And without the concept time, could an appearance of an object have been perceived, i.e. without the duration in which the object could be cognized? That's a mouthful. So then, if the framework which we call space-time is itself conceptual, could the objects apparent in the conceptual framework of space-time, which all human beings are, be anything other than conceptual imaginary phantoms? Woof. Woof. All right, Ziggy. <laughs> That's what Ziggy says to that. Therefore, understand firmly and once and for all that no conceptual object, although mistaken as a separate entity, could possibly have any kind of independent existence or personal volition. No one is born, no one dies. What is born is only a concept. There is no entity to be freed. Not understanding this fact constitutes the bondage of ignorance. A perception of it is freedom of truth. And he uses this word a perception all the time. And I thought it meant non-perception, but it actually means, according to the dictionary, like a complete perception. Remember, truth is absolute correspondence with reality. It is the unshakable knowledge of man's true nature. It is the total negation of entityness. So there's nothing called an entity to be reborn or do anything or to merge into the ocean or whatever. Now let's see what Dogen has to say when he goes further with his answer to the other guy's question. He says, So remember, in the Buddha Dharma, because the body and mind are originally one reality, the saying that essence and form are not two has been understood equally in all forms of Buddhism, and we should never dare go against it. Furthermore, we should realize that living and dying, aka samsara, is just nirvana. Buddhists have never discussed nirvana outside of living and dying. Moreover, even if we wrongly imagine the understanding that mind becomes eternal by getting free of the body to be the same as the Buddha wisdom that is free of life and death, the mind that is conscious of this understanding still appears and disappears moment by moment. So even if you think that's true, then your, your mind is not uh, this constant thing that, that stays one way forever and ever. And so it is not eternal at all. Then isn't this understanding unreliable? Remember, the phrase, in the Buddha Dharma, the essential state of mind universally includes all forms, that's the phrase, describes the whole great world of Dharma inclusively without dividing essence and form and without discussing appearance and disappearance. And then the next section is where I think the two different philosophies start to come together. Dogen says, there is no state, not even Bodhi or Nirvana, that is different from the essential state of mind. All dharmas, myriad phenomena, and accumulated things are totally just the one mind without exclusion or disunion. Accumulated things is a way of saying the material universe, which is an accumulation of things, you know, uh, quarks and leptons and molecules and atoms and so forth. This being so, how could we divide this one reality into body and mind or into life and death and nirvana? Now that line all dharmas, myriad phenomena, and accumulated things are totally just one mind without exclusion or disunion. That's uh, the Nishijima Cross translation. Shohaku Okumura's translation uh, makes it a little bit more juicier or clearer, I think. His version says, Without exception, all the myriad phenomena in the entire universe are nothing other than this one mind with everything included and interconnected. Now it's important to understand what Dogen means when he says mind, so let's get into that. This is from Mind Here and Now is Buddha, and Dogen says, Hearing the words, the mind here and now, 
the foolish think that the considering, knowing, thinking, and perceiving of living beings, not yet having brought forth the mind of Bodhi, that's enlightenment, is taken as the Buddha. This is because they've never met a true teacher, so that means they're wrong. And later on he says, Clearly, mind is mountains, rivers, and the earth, the sun, the moon, and the stars. So that's what he means when he says mind. But what these words say is, when we are moving forward, not enough, and when we are drawing back, too much. And that just means moving forward, not enough, is like we're not getting good enough in this, uh, and, and drawing backwards too much is when we kind of doubt it, we doubt it a little too much. He continues, Mind as mountains, rivers, and the earth is nothing other than mountains, rivers, and the earth. There is no additional waves or surf, no wind or smoke. Mind as the sun, the moon, and the stars is nothing other than the sun, the moon, and the stars. There is no additional fog or mist. Mind as living and dying, coming and going is nothing other than living and dying, coming and going. There is no additional delusion or realization. Mind as fences, walls, tiles, and pebbles is nothing other than fences, walls, tiles, and pebbles. There is no additional mud or water. And he kind of goes on like that for a few more sentences. So the mind he's talking about isn't that he's like adding mind to the existing things. Like he's not saying that there's all the things in the universe and then we add universal mind to it up here. And you know, he's saying that these things that we see, including yourself, including the laptop or iPhone or whatever the hell you're watching this on, these are all manifestations of the one mind. And one of the differences that I've discussed between the Advaita Vedanta philosophy and uh, Buddhist philosophy is Advaita Vedanta tends to use the word consciousness as the same thing as the Buddhists mean when they say mind and vice versa. The, the Buddhists tend to use the word consciousness in a way that the Advaita Vedanta people use mind, so it gets very confusing. But if you kind of dig into their philosophies and see how they describe these things, you can see that they're kind of talking about the same thing using different terminology. So anyway, getting back to the point of this at the beginning, do we dissolve into the ocean of essence or not? Well, I don't take Nisargadatta Maharaj or Dogen as, you know, the way some people interpret the Bible like it. The Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. I don't take it that way. I, I take it as something that these two people were very concerned with what Dogen calls the great matter of life and death, and so am I. And these two guys went into it more deeply, I would say, than I have. And so a lot of their ideas make perfect sense to me based on my own experience with this stuff and a lot of their ideas kinda I, I just have to wonder is that right? I don't know. But when you really get down to it, Nisargadatta Maharaj and the questioner to Dogen both say this thing about dissolving into the ocean of, of reality, you know, into everything. And Dogen doesn't ever deny that happens. What he is denying is the idea that there is this essence that moves throughout the process. So he says, uh, this is in mind here and now as Buddha, the non-Buddhist Seneca, that's a, 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 I'm not sure if Seneca or Shrenica, I've actually seen it written too, said, in our body there is a single spiritual essence. When the body decays, the spirit departs, just as when a house is burning, the master of the house departs. The house is inconstant, the master of the house is constant. When I examine people like this, people who say these things, they do not know the false from the true. So Dogen is really you know, hammering home that he does not agree with that idea. Now, does Nisargadatta Maharaj agree with that idea? Well, he says, again in pointers from Nisargadatta Maharaj, what is born, the objective body, will in due course die. Thereafter it will be dissolved, i.e. irrevocably annihilated. The life force will leave the body and mingle with the air outside. The objective part of what was once a sentient being will be destroyed, never to be reborn as the same body. And consciousness is not an object, not a thing at all. Therefore, consciousness as something non-objective cannot be born, cannot die, and certainly cannot be reborn. Who is born and who dies? And who is to be reborn? So a lot of people apparently in India didn't like the fact that Nisargadatta Maharaj denied the idea of rebirth, which Dogen also denied, so, you know, there you go. Uh, what happens is this wrong understanding uh, in, in Nisargadatta Maharaj's terminology um, leads to a situation in which 
a phantom with a supposed autonomous existence gets created. This phantom is supposed to have choice of decision and action. It is this phantom that is supposed to be born, to live, to suffer, and to die. So there you go. I, I think I kind of put both arguments out there, and if you want to refer to the books themselves and see what you think, you can see. I come to the conclusion that we're kind of describing the same thing in different ways, and you could probably find other uh, religions and philosophies that do the same thing as well. I just thought that was real interesting and thought I would present it to you on this nice gray Tuesday morning here in Los Angeles. If you want to contribute to me being able to uh, give you more of this kind of stuff, please donate to the link that you are seeing below. That is how I make most of my money, not from book royalties and not from speaking fees, but from your donations. I thank you very much for your donations. If you are having trouble financially, don't donate to me. But those of you who are donating are the ones who keep me in dog food and ice cream well uh, not that much ice cream but anyway that's all i could think of at the moment thank you very much have a good time all the time see you later bye